Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Inside Definity series, um, in which I show you um, clips generally from our um, weekly global R&D meeting. Um, at this meeting, uh, you know, typically get between 100 and 150 people at the moment. And, um, you know, uh, you get engineers and researchers doing demos and reporting on various things and work that's underway. Um, in this episode, I'm going to show you a clip um, that relates to the um, development of the Matoko smart contract language. So for, for, for those of you that are new to development um, on the internet computer, um, we uh, use a WebAssembly virtual machine. A smart contract is known as a canister, and it's a bundle of WebAssembly and persistent memory pages that it runs inside. So um, when you uh, write high-level code, and it could be in a language like Rust, another language, or it could be Matoko, which is what we're going to talk about in a sec. Uh, that high-level code, you know, the data that you're uh, manipulating in your variables, objects, data types, collections, whatever, um, just lives within these persistent memory pages in a system of orthogonal persistence. Now, um, you can potentially compile any language um, to uh, canister smart contract and run it on the internet computer. Um, currently, the two most popular languages, however, are Rust and Matoko. Um, Rust is a you know, well-known um, uh, systems language that's very widely used. Um, Matoko is a brand new um, smart contract language um, that we started developing way back in, in 2017. And, and I can hear you ask already, like, why, why did you take on the challenge of developing a completely new language? Well. Uh, the answer is that um, we wanted the ability to design a language um, that could um, add features that would make working in the internet computer environment easier. Um, and um, for those, again, of you that don't know, these um, canister smart contracts are actually software actors. They can only access their own persistent memory pages, and um, you know they call each other asynchronously. And this allows the internet computer to run any number of smart contracts in parallel um, using deterministic uh, message passing. You know, a function call and a function result is a message. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, Matoko um, has features that allows the coding to uh, allows you to code in, in a synchronous style, um, which provides a lovely on ramp for um, you know, your general developers who might be coming from, say, a JavaScript background. And um, we also do things like you know, um, have uh, you know, support un unlimited precision number types. So um, you know, um, a rational number's got unlimited precision. This, this can be very useful in, in, in DeFi. The language um, was, has been and continues to be developed by a team led by Andreas Rosberg. Now, um, before joining uh, Definity back in 2017, um, Andreas, uh, I think he was the um, chief language architect on V8, I think, um, which is you know the, the the JavaScript engine that powers Node and Chrome and so on and so forth. And um, most importantly, he was the co-inventor designer of WebAssembly itself, which is this new um, virtual machine standard, which is now supported by all the major web browsers, and um, that the internet computer uses to run smart contracts as part of a wider framework. And it's also being you know, also more widely adopted now um, as a back-end um, machine, you know, virtual machine for running back-end code in places like um, Cloudflare. So um, Andreas has been able to sort of meld a lot of different requirements together. You know, he's de devised an, an, a very modern new language um, that will be very, very easy to learn for people coming from, say, JavaScript backgrounds while providing um, serious engineers with um, a good solid framework for building very complex, you know, large scale smart contract systems. Um, He's added features like you know unlimited precision um, integers and rationals and so on, um, which are obviously useful for financial applications. 
Um, and he's designed added features, you know, that that make it very easy to program in, in you know, an asynchronous smart contract environment. You know, you can program in a synchronous style. Um, now he's also added um, features that uh, make it much easier to work with orthogonal persistence. So um, one of the differences between you know internet computer smart contracts and say uh, smart contracts on Ethereum is that you can optionally upgrade uh, smart contracts running on the internet computer. Um, each, each smart contract has something called a controller ID. Now, if you set the controller ID to zero, um, you've you've got a smart contract that can't be updated rather like a smart contract on Ethereum. But you can also, you know, um, set the controller ID to, to your own principle, and that's the default, obviously, when you upload it. And, and that will um, enable you to upgrade it. Um, similarly, you can also set that controller ID to a service nervous system. Uh, it's a new feature coming, which is the equivalent of the network nervous system, so that, you know, uh, uh, this an algorithmic governance system, only an algorithmic governance system can then upgrade the smart contracts. Eff effectively, it runs you know, under the control of probably thousands or um, possibly tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of, of voting neurons. Um, so when, you know, this is where it gets a bit complex. When you upgrade a, a smart contract, um, remember that all of its data types, you know, all, all the data just lives in these persistent memory pages and you might be changing those data types. For example, you know, you, you 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 might have uh, a user profile and you might add a status field to it, right? Now the layout's different in memory. So um, there's a there's a thing called an upgrade constructor that allows you to, um, you know, um, migrate your memory. Um, but it, there's a lot, there are more features than that. You, you know, actually canister um, memory is um, distinguished being volatile memory that, that is completely wiped when you upgrade and stable memory that isn't, up, isn't wiped. Anyways, um, Matoko um, introduces, you know, uh, type safety to the upgrade process to make the whole thing much safer. Um, and uh, Andreas is going to talk talk about um, that work. He's laid out a, a, a new roadmap. Much of the Matoko team was working other things. To the, we just needed the um, firepower to get the network live. And and you know that team's now you know reconvened and, and works work on Matoka's accelerating again. Um, after um, Andreas talks, I'm taking another clip from the same global R&D where a guy called Omer um, talks about the modifications he's making to the um, Matoko garbage collection system. Um, so that's something I sh something else I should mention. You know, Matoko is actually a, a garbage collected system, which makes it um, very easy to use and it makes it a very productive language. Yet, um, you know, it's still able on the internet computer um, to um, run deterministically, or, or rather it's possible for developers to just code, not worry about memory collection, and for the underlying system to, um, you know, free unused memory with, without becoming, while, while maintaining determinism. Okay, um, that was quite a long introduction. Obviously, this is quite a technical subject. Let's, let's watch the demo. Yeah. Hi. So, um, yeah, I, I will tell, tell you something about what the language team is up to. So as some of you have probably observed, uh, where most of the year, the Motoko work has been a little bit on a back burner because like most of our team actually got borrowed away, snatched away, but to work on other stuff. But now, like at least a, a smaller team has has kind of reconvened, and we were able to construct a little roadmap of what we actually want to work on now. And just uh, up front is like we we are still a smaller team now, and um, so we have to focus. And the main themes we we think are that we are able to focus on is mainly like consolidation and and supporting IC functionality. So that our are the two themes we're really concentrating on. And more concretely, there are like three bigger things here for the next one or two quarters. So one is um, making canister upgrades safe. So currently the situation is that you can just upgrade a, ca a canister and randomly break clients. You can also break yourself if you have stable data 
and you change the type in, in certain ways, then this is not checked and you will just lose your data. So there are two checks we need to implement and this has been clear from far along, but um, we never really did that because we're lacking a little bit of infrastructure. So the first check that should happen when you upgrade a canister is that there's an interface conformance check regarding the Kennet uh, interface. And Kennet was, was designed to enable that check. So we have the check, but it's not hooked up essentially. And the other check is more like Motoko specific, which is checking the types of stable variables when you upgrade so that the data that was stable and gets reinserted with the new version of the code is actually still readable and understandable by that code. And for both these things to make that actually work and kind of automatic, we need support from the IC um, to be able to store these, these information, this type and in, in interface information in live canisters as a form of metadata. There currently is no support for that. We, we hacked around it so far, but it would be nice to have a more suitable solution there. So that's one big thing, I think, and people have complained about the risk of losing data there. Then the next big one is uh, garbage collection. So Omar is working on that and we'll present a little bit more detail later um, today. Um, and he has been working on that for, for half a year or longer now already, like since the beginning of the year, I think. Um, and the goal there obviously is to, to make the garbage collector better, so reduce the cost of garbage collection. So Motoko started out with a super naive, just two space garbage collector just to get off the ground. Um, and what that has already been um, improved uh, recently to enable compaction and to have a smarter um, collection scheduling so that you don't collect after every method, but only up if there have been sufficiently many uh, allocations. So it's really worthwhile doing the work. But the more important one is that from there on, we want to move to um, support generational collection so that really when you do a collection, you don't have to walk the entire heap. That is kind of stupid. So we really want to more, have a more modern garbage collector where all the most of the collections are minor. That means you only look at the newly allocated data. It's linear in the, in the size of allocated data. And on top of that, the remaining major, so-called major collections you have to do, they also should happen incremental so that you don't have these peak costs anymore where you hit a major collection. Um, so these are all like well-known techniques in, in garbage collection, um, but basically Irma is working on implementing all them for, for Motoko. And another detail there is that we all, he's also working right now to moving to a page-based heap so that we can match like the IC's cost model for pages and make better use of memory locality so that we have better access patterns that are cheaper. Um, and then the last kind of group of things is like keeping up with all the things that have been added to the IC recently. There have been quite a few ad hoc features that have been added uh, leading up to, to the release, uh, the Mercury release. And, some of these are not supported yet in Motoko, like certified variable success checks and, and heartbeat and some other things. And we basically, this is more like a design question than so much implementation work because most of these actually do not fit the programming model at all. They're kind of like outliers there. So we really have to think about how they should be surfaced in Motoko and if we can kind of Ban them to a library, maybe, or something like that. And one particular feature that we want to expose more directly is stable memory, so that we want to in, like get us on par with Rust, so that you can, for example, write in memory abstractions in Motopo directly that make low level use of the stable memory. And then there are mis miscellaneous other things, like we want to add logging and some extensions to Candid, some compiler optimizations. But these are like the big, big topics that will keep us busy. And just to be clear on that, yeah. So you don't see any real feature work here. And that is, was a very conscious decision. We have a list of features that we think are still missing from Motoko. But right now we really have to focus on these things because they're more, more important to, to get done. And I think that's all I had. Thank you, Andreas. It's really great improvements you achieved or the entire team achieved. Let's go on with Omar on Motoko garbage collection. Yes, hello, uh, I'm Omar. So I, I work with the language team mainly on uh, Motoko garbage collector. So in, in five minutes, I will very quickly try to explain how Motoko's garbage collector works today and um, what are the problems with it and what we are currently working on to improve. 
so with a summary heap, um, you can think of it as a four gigabyte large byte array. At the beginning, um, we have some static data for things like uh, string uh, literals. Um, after that, the dynamic heap begins. That in the dynamic dynamic heap is where we do uh, allocate objects uh, in runtime. Uh, so to allocate an object, we we maintain an allocation pointer. Basically, we increment it, and the odd value of the allocation pointer becomes the address of the allocated object. So after a few allocations, right before a garbage collection, uh, the heap looks like this. So the yellow areas are the data that will be potentially used in, in the program. So those need to be uh, uh, maintained. And the others are basically unused data. And we, I, we basically want to be able to use a space for, for those data uh, for allocations in the, in the next messages. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. So what we do is we copy all live data to the region after allocation pointer first. Um, next slide. And then all that data is copied back to the beginning of the heap. Um, so, uh, and then we reset the allocation pointer. Next slide, please. So after this, basically we have all the live data uh, in the beginning of, of, of the heap and the area allocation pointer is set, uh, reset. Uh, so the, the area between allocation pointer and the end of the web assembly uh, can now be used for allocations and effectively reclaim the area uh, that, that, that was previously used for uh, that data. So um, this has some good properties. It doesn't have fragmentation issues like we would have in a malloc style allocator. Uh, and the cost size is great, but it also has some problems. For example, the memory utilization is a problem. Currently, we can't have at most two gigabytes of live data because for anything larger, we won't have data to copy. Uh, the, 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 we don't have space to copy the live data um, so in, in general, for example, if, if I have three gigabytes of, of data and I can't have more than one gigabyte of live data, um, if I have, then I won't be able to copy it and the canister will get stuck. Um, so another downside is copying all live data back and forth on every garbage collection is wasteful. So if, if, a, if a data is, is long lived, it will be used for many, many messages. Uh, it doesn't make sense to copy it in, in every garbage collect, co collection. And also access patterns are not that great. So copy, all this copying is, um, results in uh, modifying a lot of pages. Next slide, please. So what we do to address this, I will first uh, start with the things that we've done. Um, we've ported garbage collector to Rust and did a lot of infra infrastructure work. So currently, for example, we can test the garbage collectors without writing a single line of Motoko. We can um, create a heap and test GC uh, garbage collection in, in style of uh, unit tests. Um, we implemented a new garbage collection algorithm. Uh, in it, it is uh, enabled with dash dash compacting GC flag in compile time. Uh, it provides better, better heap utilization and access patterns, but the cycles are slightly worse. We have benchmarks in, in pull request 2650 in the PR description. And we also have a better GC scheduling algorithm. Um, uh, so um, this is, uh, I can get into the detail, but basically solves the problem with, with quadratic GC cost in some cases. So if, uh, if you've ever seen a multiple case so that does uh, same amount of work in each message, but, uh, but does, um, does, uh, uses more cycles with each message because the live heap, heap grows, then this, this uh, scheduling should fix that issue. So we have two ideas now to uh, improve the, the issues. Uh, one of them is, um, collecting long-lived data less frequently. It's called generational GC, a very well-known idea in the literature. And then another one is distributing GC costs across messages. Again, a similarly known, very well-known idea. But for any of those, we first need to do some groundwork and uh, we have two pull requests that are currently in progress um, as shown here. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, if we have time, I can take questions. Otherwise I could take them offline. Thanks. Great, thank you, Irma.